Then sings my soul, my Savior God. together. Lord, we love you today. We acknowledge that it is your hand on our country that was even caused it to be formed. Our founding fathers capitalized providence. They meant you. They acknowledge that you are the only savior, that God alone can arrange the affairs of this world to bring about good. And the purpose was righteousness. Lord, we have wandered as a nation. We have strayed. Our national psyche is rebellion against you. As your word declares, we have each one turned to our own ways. But Lord, today we acknowledge that your way is the right way. And Lord, we repent of our own sins. Never mind the others. I have my own I'm accountable for. Lord, we appeal to the mercies of God. Your goodness. Your never-ending graciousness. 
Your loving kindness is better than life itself because if we did not have your loving kindness, there'd be no life. So Lord, we appeal today for your mercy that for the sake of a few righteous, Lord, you not turn us all into the hell that we all deserve. Lord, raise up people with a conscience who would stand for the right, that would be bold and would not allow wickedness to rule. Lord, we pray for our leaders that there would be a spirit of conviction come upon them. They'd grow a conscience. That corruption would be exposed. That once again we could be called a Christian nation without being embarrassed by it. Now, Lord, may the church of Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior of all mankind, be filled with sweetness, but filled with power from on high. Not in title or name only. Forget the label on the door or the denomination, but Lord, may the spirit of the living God and dwell those who follow after Jesus. May our lives be earmarked by a great grace that sets us all free, for that we give you praise and thanks. In the holy and matchless name of Jesus, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Well, it could just be me, but um, it feels to me like there's a sweetness of the Spirit of the Lord in this place. And I, when that happens, I, it occurs to me that this has got to be a down payment of what heaven's like. It, it just, because I can hardly stand it. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation. So in a, in a serious note, I, I, I want to just put it on record, on video, that we are honoring today those who are not any longer among us due to the tragedy of 9-11. I didn't know anybody personally there, but I want to honor, just as a generic fact, those heroes who were common citizens who said, Au contraire! You're not doing that to this plane. And they took over and said, no, you don't. We'll give our life to stop that. The cause of freedom has always taken an effort by those who desire to be free. It isn't free. It costs somebody a lot. And if others hadn't given the ultimate, you and I wouldn't be sitting here today in freedom. So there are those who have given service of their lives in volunteer fashion, as Peggy does, to the American Legion, in, in whom hall, whose hall we meet here today. This is her hall. Okay, I, it's not quite true, but she uh, uh, is a part of this post, and if it hadn't been for her uh, foresight and prompting, uh, we would have been somewhere else or not at all. But the Lord arranged for Peggy to be at the right place at the right time for all of us. So, Peggy, we thank you. Uh, several times a week or as needed, Peggy will go be part of a crew that uh, does the 21-gun salute at veterans' graves uh, services, the funerals um, at the graveside or whoever else she's needed, and the whole group of people volunteer to do that, and, and she's done that for a lot of years. I bet you've lost count of the number, 20 years. I was going to say the number of times you've done it. So, 
But the, the point is there are those who serve and they have a heart to serve. No organization can exist without those like that who have a heart to serve. And in reality, it's the heart of Jesus. And so we honor those. We all remember, probably, maybe not everybody in this room, but most of us remember where we were when President Kennedy got shot. I was there. You were there? Did you pull the trigger? <laughs> no, okay. But you were in Dallas? I saw him 20 minutes before the shooting. I was the IBM headquarters on Turtle Creek Boulevard. As the motorcade went by. Wow. This is Wayne Scott, everybody. As you can see, that he is Mr. President Lincoln. He, yes, yeah. <laughs> the show tonight at 8 o'clock, yeah. <clears throat> uh, he plays Lincoln in lots of events throughout the valley and, um, and most of it for free. But uh, an honorable man, who, a former police officer, and just uh, dedicated his life to service. Um, there, there are many among us who are that way, and we thank you even if you get paid for that life of service. Everybody has to eat. So all of the ex-military, we honor you today. Matter of fact, I, I wonder, I don't mean to embarrass anyone, but if you are ex-military, would you mind uh, standing to your feet? Vietnam. Bless you. You can be seated. I know that uh, November 11th is Veterans Day, but, and, and we'll do that again, but uh, we can't honor enough those who decide that's where I'm going to lay my life. Now, you're writing a check. It may not ever get cashed, but you're willing to write the check payable with your life to ensure that the rest of us have freedom. We don't take that lightly. We honor you for that. I know where I was when 9-11 was brought to my attention and um, couldn't believe my eyes, glued to the TV for a few hours and saw the buildings come down. Uh, not like um, the Queen had died or something. No offense to England's royalty. That didn't capture my attention, but the hackles on the back of my neck stood up when I saw what was happening to our country. And uh, if there had been something I could have done, I would have. Um, I lived at the time a half a block from Clovis High School. And I decided to walk down there, and there were police cars in front. And I went up and I thanked them. I said, I'm just, I've got two kids who go to school here right now, and I want to thank you for being here. Um, that life of commitment and dedication and sacrifice helping and serving the community. Those are Christian values. Now, one does not have to be a Christian to adopt those values. And living those values out does not make you Christian. But those characteristics should mark the lives of every person who's a follower after Jesus. John 15, 13, There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends much less a stranger. Wayne, would you stand and lead us all in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. And I'm going to just break that down a little bit, and then we'll go home. It's been said that diversity is our strength. I don't believe that. You hear it all the time. You even hear it in churches. I don't believe it. Diversity, by definition, is division. It's distinctive. It's a separating of people. I'll tell you what our strength is. It's unity. 
despite our diversities, despite our differences, unity, coming together for a common goal, a common good, a common purpose. There's where strength lies. You can be as divergent as you want, as different as you want, but when you unite together with others for the common good, for a common cause, that's an unbreakable bond. There is strength there. You remember after, um, well, after 9-11, we would drive around and you'd see spontaneous gatherings on street corners, flags waving, people being proud of their country, supporting America. Now, we sang a song today, something about mend her every flaw. We acknowledge that there are flaws in our systems, in our people, but we're not saying it's okay. We're saying, God, help us mend those flaws. We want everything to be righteous, holy, and pure, and right. But when we talk about unity, I guess the question should become, well, unity around what? And um, it's a common set of values and basic ethics around the Judeo-Christian value system displayed by a common language, a common morality, common laws, and common freedoms that we should all feel the burden to exemplify, to honor, to live, to support, and a matter of fact, to insist that those things be carried out. It, it matters not to me what your nation of origin. It matters to me that you don't also adopt our nation. If you're going to come live here, at some point you need to learn the language. You need to support our laws, beginning with how you get into this country. Listen, everybody in the world wants a better life. At least they should. But you don't get this one unless you come in the front door. So to all my listeners and viewers today that are Democrats, that should have everyone's attention. <laughs> Would you please speak to the leaders of your party or change parties? Because we cannot continue as a nation without a border without laws. So the way things are headed, if you support the anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-American system that is supported by the Democrat Party, you need to rethink that. If you're a follower of Jesus, for goodness sakes, get your Bible out. Read it. Vote accordingly. Am I saying that the Republican Party is righteous? Absolutely not. But they're the only two options that could ever get anybody elected. I would vote for the Dale Party. <laughs> I'd make right decisions. Most of you would make right decisions. I'd vote for you if I thought you could win. But there's so much corruption and malfeasance and uh, downright underhanded stuff Thinking corruption, it just galls me on both parties. If we could do it, if we knew how to do it, I would vote them all out. All 535 and all 100. And say, go get a real job. And don't come back to this job until you know how to function in the real world. How dare you make a law that doesn't affect you? How dare you affect, uh, enable, or enact a health system that doesn't affect you? How dare you make rulings about Social Security that don't affect you? Shut up. Get out. Leave my country alone, you stinking rats. I hesitate to tell you how I really feel. I'm indignant. I'm upset. We're supposed to be one nation. 
Not two nations. Not five. One. Yeah, we got problems. You know, if you're a melting pot, a true melting pot, everything looks the same. You eventually take on the characteristics of all of those that are beside you. In the body of Christ. Pardon my self-medication here. In the body of Christ, we give up an old life to take on a new life. You give up the old self to become a new self. When you come to this country, there's some things you should give up so that we can all partake of the brand new us. We're glad you're here if you came legally. If you're here illegally, we're not so glad. Why should I support you? What have you done to deserve to put your hand in my pocket? Come on, people. This isn't complicated. Don't try to tell me that your morality is better than mine. Don't tell me that you're more compassionate than I am. You're a stinking liar. It is selective. It is political in nature. It is to garner more votes for your party. And I'm sick and tired of it. We'll see how long this video stays up. (laughs) 1 Corinthians 12 says uh, the, the church of the Lord is one body with many parts. But we have a common heartbeat, don't we? Well, wish our country could be that way. We can still be unique, and you can be different, but that should not be the emphasis. The new identity is the emphasis. If we're one in Christ Jesus, we can be one country. Americans, despite our heritage, despite our history, despite our ancestry, we're not all the same, but our common goal is unity around shared values. This isn't complicated. One nation, under God. And I know that that phrase was added later, and there were those who'd like to take it out. Well, go live in Canada. (laughs) Our founding documents, both federal and often in the states, and many of our early institutions made it very clear that the God of the Bible was the one who was being honored and appealed to for wisdom, protection, and guidance. Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now, we give individuals freedom in this country to choose any or no religion. We don't demand that you become a Christian. But I do demand that you leave me alone. Don't make me give up either practices or ideals because it offends you. Go home. It's real easy. If you reject our religion, I don't, I don't hate you for that. I might think you could make a better choice. But if you're, let's say you're Muslim, and you want to live in this country in freedom, if you are not anti-American, welcome if you came in the front door. But I'm not obligated to try to make you comfortable. I'm not obligated to try to get you to agree with me. But I am obligated by love to share with you what I think. I'm obligated. Have you heard the real story about Jesus? You know he can't just be one of your prophets. Because he said he was the son of God. God in the flesh. And if he's the... If he's that, he demands to be worshipped. If he said he was that and he's not that, he's a liar and a fraud. So he's not just a good teacher. He's the savior or he's a fraud. You don't get it both ways. A little basic logic there for those of you who live in other parts of the country that don't teach anything. Romans 2.14 Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they're doing right. So you're either being accused or your conscience says you're okay. But I I found this to be true. But let me read verse 16. And this is the message I proclaim, 
that the day is coming when God through Christ Jesus will judge everyone's secret life. Every person knows in their heart that God's way is the right way. Everybody knows truth from a lie. Everybody knows right from wrong. Everybody. Everybody. There are no exceptions. None. I can just hear somebody in their head. Their mind is racing, trying to find an exception. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. Paul instructs us to pray for our country. 1 Timothy 2. I'm going to read from the NIV. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Romans 13, I believe it is, that said there is no authority that God did not put in place. Stolen election or not. You want to know what I think about that? Oh, come on, beg me. (laughs) There were more votes cast in this last election, if you believe all the votes were cast, than in any election ever. And if you're going to tell me that one individual got way more than the other, I'm going to say that you have a reality problem. Mail-in voting is fraud. Can I prove it? Nah. Don't need to. I have logic. I have common sense. I know what I know. Does it matter? Not at all. Not at all. It doesn't matter who you voted for. It doesn't matter who you will vote for. It doesn't matter your party. What matters is are you walking to the biblical precepts laid forth in the Bible? Are you honoring God with your vote and with your life? If you are, then... God will have to talk to you about any mistake you're making. Just vote the Bible. Just don't put in power those who want to say it's okay to kill a baby in the womb. That is not a mother's choice. A mother's choice is to raise the child in her womb. If she wants to make a choice, it should be made earlier. What if she was raped? Well, you know, first of all, what percentage that is of all the abortions? Infinitesimal. Secondly, my wife is the product of a rape. A girl was 14 years old and was raped by a deputy sheriff out in the country in Washington. When she was 15, she had Pam. Her older sister had had one child and was unable to have any more children and said, I'll take her. So her real mom, she grew up knowing as her aunt, But is there anybody in their right mind that would think that Pam should have been aborted? Was it inconvenient for that girl? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. God watches everything. He is paying attention. If he can know the hair's number on your head, he's always watching you. Does God initiate evil? No. But God, who through foreknowledge, could look through time and say, that baby is made for that guy. Because what I've called him to do, she's the perfect mate for him. And God, in his infinite wisdom saw that what today would have been a prime candidate for abortion was a gift from God to me and my family and this church and the world. So it's just 
the, the morality calibrator is all messed up. Go back to the basics of the Bible and just keep it simple. God loves us all. We all make dumb choices and dumb mistakes. I voted for Jimmy Carter. <laughs> I was in my mid-twenties. I didn't follow politics closely. I just knew he was a Baptist. And in spite of that, I voted for him, Paul. <laughs> I thought, he's a Christian, for crying out loud. That's got to be a good thing in Washington. A Christian going to Washington as president? Good deal. Not so good, as it turns out. <laughs> Little did I know. See, your Christianity ought to impact your whole life. Your whole life. Your values your voting, your living, your business, your interaction, your Christianity should affect everything about your life. Should. So if you find a place that suddenly you, be, you become aware, well, that's kind of inconsistent. Make an adjustment. Ask the Lord for wisdom. It's, it's not complicated. Jesus, teach me your ways. I want to walk in your ways. Just be honorable. We should be one nation under God, and then we should be indivisible as opposed to invisible. <laughs> See, unity is threatened when it all becomes about my rights. In the days after 9-11, we were all thinking, what could I do to help? And many people from our part of the country even went to New York to help uh, pull people out of that debris pile. People from all over everywhere came together for the common good. There were flags everywhere. We felt pride and unity and we rallied, if you want to use that term. You felt it. You felt a sense of, um, I don't know, of, of pride. And um, then they suggested after a while things should go back to normal. And man, did they ever. Politics and partisanship came roaring back with a vengeance. Church attendance was up for a short time. Then it cooled off. Ephesians 4.13 says, Until all of us are united in the faith and in the full knowledge of God's Son, and until we attain mature adulthood and the full standard of development in the Messiah, or maturity, wouldn't that be nice? It's not always evident. But Jesus should purify our heart, should purify our motive. We should only want to please him. And man, if somebody you've supported at any level of office is out of line, let them know. You're, you're not supporting my values. That's not what I believe in. If you're going to represent me, then here's what I think and here's what I believe. You need to represent me. I'm a constituent. Represent me and my values. If you're of a different value system, I won't vote for you next time. Make it simple. But I'll tell you this. The church is very powerful when it operates in unity, living out the great commandment and trying to obey the great commission. What's the great commandment? I mentioned it last week. The golden rule. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Love others the way you love you. You love you plenty. Please believe. There's no shortage of love for you. <laughs> I told Pam, I need to write a, gospel, a southern country song. It needs to be, Mama, she don't love me like I do. <laughs> I don't, and I won't. I can't love you because I'm loving me instead of loving you. Or something on that nature. I'm working on it. There you go. Good man. And she's a keeper, too. You know, we don't fulfill the Great Commission. We obey it. God decides when it's fulfilled. But we are to go, to preach, to teach, to make disciples, to teach the word. Let the chips fall where they may. The truth is the truth, whether you like it or you like it or you like it, or you don't like it or you don't like it or you don't like it. It doesn't make any difference who likes it. We don't teach, preach, and make disciples to try to gain a following or to try to be popular or try to be liked. 
No offense, but I couldn't care less if you like me. Because I'm going to stand before God, and he's going to ask me, did you do what I said? Did you say what I told you to say? And you better bet your bippy if you've got one. I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell it. I'm going to say it. Well, that's not going to be very nice. Sue me. I'm trying to be nice. I'm tired of being nice. It isn't that it's not loving. Sometimes the greatest act of love is to tell somebody the truth. This is the truth. Haven't you ever had to do that with your kids? Hey, lighten up. This is the truth. Jesus said this in his prayer in John 17. I pray they'll be, all will be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, the Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. How can the world believe we're Christians and followers after Jesus if our lives don't match the scriptures? That's called a hypocrite. Let's not do that. With liberty and justice. These two go hand in hand. Liberty and justice. Unchecked liberty leads to anarchy. Unrestrained justice leads to totalitarianism. I don't need you to think for me. I don't need you to make decisions for me about any shots I might want to take or not take. Stay out of my life. That doesn't just apply to abortions. It applies to everything. Leave me a stinking loan. I'm able to make my own decisions about all that. You can make yours and I won't bother you. I'm going to make mine or not make mine, and you don't bother me, and we get along fine. A free and open society, however, carries within it the seeds of its own destruction because freedom to choose and make wrong decisions is a freedom. So we could all go south if everybody decided at one time to be um, negligent or uh, maleficent or... If we weren't honest, if we decided as a country we we never were going to vote again, or if we decided we didn't like morality, listen, we all have a responsibility to do the right thing and encourage the right thing in others. Can't make them, but you can encourage, you can model it, you can hopefully urge people to come the right direction, and you can certainly admit if you've made a, an error. And, and we can somehow find grace. We found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's find grace in the eyes of each other. Here's the thought. John Adams said this. You know who John Adams is? That's his uncle. <laughs> John Adams, one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence, one of our early leaders. That, that too. We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Human passions unbridled by morality and religion. There's no law that can mess with you. I mean, if you're not willing to let morality and religion throttle you back, there's no law in the world that will fix this. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That's why the present government of the United States isn't working. We've decided laws don't matter. We'll only enforce the ones we want. What? Why did we pass them? If you won't uphold them, if you won't enforce them, why do we have them? Take them off the books, you coward. Vote on it. We've thrown God out. We have selective morality. We have selective enforcement. We have selective obedience. And we all operate, well, not necessarily we all, but a lot of people operate in what I call compensation mode. I won't do this, but I will do that. I won't enforce those laws, but I will enforce these. No, 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 no. You don't get to do that. All of the laws are enforceable. You don't get to say... I won't enforce those, but I will enforce it. You don't get to do that. If that's how you're going to operate, you have to be out. If 
the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Freedom without Christ really doesn't work because you're not free until you can say no to personal habits, desires, urges, impulses. So when you are driven or when you say you're addicted, you're not free because you can't or won't say no. And by the way, we're not going to have perfect justice until Jesus comes to reign again. There's no prince without the prince of peace. There's no peace without him. Every other prince is false and phony. The real peace comes when the prince of peace arrives. Romans 2.16, I mentioned this earlier. The day is coming when God through Christ Jesus will judge everyone's secret life. And then this should fit us all. All of us who live here should consider the obligations, the rights, and responsibilities of freedom and justice equally shared. We should feel it's my responsibility to speak for the right. When you see wrong, do something about it. Say something about it. But we've been intimidated by the loud, vocal, minority, obnoxious, hard left. I hear people on TV say the, Lord, uh, the hard, loud, obnoxious is the hard right. Could be some truth there too. But I'm not that person. I'm a down the middle, there's, there's no gray. There's black and there's white. There's right and there's wrong. There's truth and there's fiction. The good old boy network where the elites are exempt from the law, that doesn't work for me. We salute those who go to work every day, put on a uniform and lay your life on the line, not for those you love, but for complete strangers. We salute you. You're the honorable among us. We can't live in this society without you. But listen to this, Romans 5. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sets the standard and he's the model for each of us. Showing up at the right time for people that don't even know you or you don't know and doing the right thing for them when it's needed. Let me give you five quick things as what I'm going to call action points. We're out of here. I should say so. Man, I'm long-winded. Um, find a way to thank a first responder this week. Find somebody who's a first responder or somebody wearing a uniform and say, thank you for your service. Number two, pray for our country, the civil servants, the leaders at every level of government. Pray for them. And not that God will take them out. Pray for them. God will give them wisdom. Pray for them that God will save them. Maybe if they were Christians, they'd act differently. They'd think differently. Number three, submit to God's authority in your own life. What has God told you to do that you're not doing? Are you in compensation mode? Lord, I don't want to do that, but I'll do this instead. No, 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 no. Go back, do what he said. Number four, find somebody that's in need and help them. Just help somebody that's in need. Number five, spiritually resist. The spirit of Antichrist by prayer and by other actions led by the Holy Spirit. Maybe you need to write a letter to the editor. Maybe you should write an op-ed. Maybe you should go make an appointment with the pastor and talk and say, um, what are you preaching? What, what verses are you supporting that idea with? Maybe you should vote for somebody new. I noticed around town that uh, Diane Pierce is running for Clovis City Council. She's a wonderful gal, a good believer. By the way, you may not know this, but her husband, Jeremy, is an Elvis impersonator and a really good one. <laughs> but that's not why I would vote for her. <laughs> I'd vote for her because she believes like I do about the things that matter in our, in our society and our culture. <coughs> anyway, find a way to be resistant to the antichrist spirit that's in the world. Support those who you know love the Lord at every level. Father, we know that uh, we live in a, in a time when you have designed that we be alive during these days. We feel sometimes like Lot, whose righteous soul was vexed day after day as he lived in those awful, hellish places. Lord, we want to do what you would ask us to do. We want to do the right thing. We want to have a right spirit about it. So, Lord, help us correct any area that we're missing it. 
we know that you're faithful and loving and kind and gracious, and we sh probably should be too. And so, Lord, just help us. We are your children, and we want to do right. We know that there's a lot of people that think they're doing right, and they might not be. How could we model for them a right thing? Lord, I pray for pastors today who are obligated to teach your word. May they be courageous, not fearful, not scared of men or the government or anyone else, but with passion will proclaim the Lord Jesus is the only answer for this world. Lord, help us to live that way. All those who are living lives of service, Lord, we honor them, we bless them, supply their needs, and protect them. Lord, those that are yet to be born, we pray for those babies, that they would grow up to be men and women of God. For the parents who still have children that they can influence, that are not gone from the house yet, Lord, we pray for the wisdom that they would need to raise godly people. We pray for those today who are suffering with pain or illness. We thank you for Michaela's recovery, but it's not done. We pray for continuing work in her body. We ask for Paul's deliverance. Heal him up and give him no pain. Lord, all of us who suffer from various things, we pray for your protection in our lives. We thank you for Pastor Roy, who's labored in the vineyard of the Lord for probably 60, 70 years, a long, long time. Lord, we thank you and we bless his life. We thank you, Lord, for all of the servants among us and for the work yet to be done. Give us wisdom and skill and strength and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do that. We praise you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, before we let you go, we'd like to relieve some of the weight out of your wallet. We don't want you to hurt your back carrying around all that money. So if you brought a check or an offering... To God's work today, get that ready. Our brothers will receive it in just a second. And if you have the strength, could we stand together? Yeah, just a second. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of blessing the kingdom. And bless every gift and giver we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. While you are doing that, uh, Julie needs to talk. Go. to be there and there were so many guests that we had to pull out an extra table and set it up for these project leaders that came out from the churches and I just want to encourage everyone here we set well I set a personal goal of our church doing 600 we have 321 boxes and um, I'm not real comfortable but I want to just encourage you guys to give even if it hurts. I know that, that it's difficult right now. Things are so much more expensive than they were last year. But um, last year I got boxes donated to our church. So I have 500 boxes and they donate them because they want them packed. And I'm not gonna lay a guilt trip on you guys, but I got them and we should pack them. And the, the shipping went up to $10 a box, but they're, the saying is nine is fine this year. Um, so if we, I have stuff at my house to probably finish up to 500. I'm not absolutely certain, but we are short on cash. And um, not to guilt trip anybody, <laughs> but right. You know, well, we, we thank you for the spirit in which you say that. But let me yeah. just help you. Fork it over. <laughs> check out Samaritan's Purse and the ministries that they do and Operation Christmas Child is just one aspect of yeah. it but you can go on there and, and check out what videos and stuff it's so encouraging they are changing countries they are changing lives I got to hear from a guy from Madolva yesterday it just God made it to where his family could be there they're on sabbatical right now but they're near Ukraine and that country most of the the People who can work, work in other countries and come back for like four weeks. They got the highest divorce rate. But he gets shoe boxes and they'll go door to door um, handing out shoe boxes. And he was just telling this story how like the kids, 
came back to church and they had like 60 kids that came back and wanted to come to church. And because of those 60 kids, the parents are like, why are my kids going to church? And so they just go and they plant churches and it just, it, in, that, in those countries, they, they need Jesus. We think we got it yeah. all figured out. Listen, the church of the Lord is alive and well around the world. And our little part is to fork over some cash. She does the majority of the work and we touch lives. And it's huge. So if you can afford to go to Starbucks, you can afford to not go to Starbucks, and you can put that money in Operation Christmas Child. <laughs> if you golf, you can give up golfing for a month, and you can put that money in Operation Christmas Child. You can find a way to put some money at Operation Christmas Child, and it reaps eternal rewards. So I honor you for honoring that work and participating. God bless you very much for that. So next Sunday, let's, let's have it. Okay? <laughs> Love you. Go to lunch. Behave. <laughs>